لا حمد كثيرا وطيبا مباركا في وصلوات الله وسلامه على نبينا الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول المصنف رحمه الله تعالى باب ما جاء في ذكر خاتم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Come to the chapter إخواني of what was said and what we need to know about and what was written in regards to the ring of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. We know that it was his practice, as you're going to see, bithinillah, that he used to wear a ring. And he did not take the ring, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was a Nabi in Mecca, nor did he have a ring when he was a Nabi in Al Medina at the beginning, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did not start wearing the ring until the last part of the sixth year of the Hijra because of a situation that presented itself. Al Imam al Tirmidhi is going to bring that Rahmatullahi alayhi. When we talk about the ring in the Arabic language, this is important. A few classes back, we were talking about the thobe and the qamis. And it was said that one of the great ulama of al-Islam during our time, al-Imam al-Albani, he said that the thobe of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was what we find the people from Pakistan wearing, the sirwal khamis, that that was the thobe, that when you read the hadith that described the Prophet's thobe and so forth and so on, it's not the thobe that we see that the brother is wearing and other brothers are wearing that. That's important information because we want to know. We want to know all of the details. So I was not aware of that. So we requested from some of the brothers, two of the brothers, bring that for us because we want to enlighten the community in this regard. So the point here is the ring of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How was his ring? So that the one who wants to wear it, he wears it knowing what he's doing. In the Arabic language, the ring is the khatam, the khatam. And it's not considered to be a ring if it does not have two different things going on with it. It has a metal, and then on and with that metal, there's going to be some type of gem some type of gem. It doesn't have to be expensive. And the reason why we're telling you this is that's the ring of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is the ring, the band that has a gem on it or in it. That's the ring. If it doesn't have that, then the Arabs called it a fatha, like a band. That's it. It's just a band. And again, the reason why we're making this distinction is because that was what the Prophet did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he had. The other issue about this ring issue is we have to be careful about two things. Number one, there are those people from the ulama of al-Islam who made a distinction between the things that he did and they said that this is because of ibadah. And this over here, he did it because it was the Ada. He was just an Arab, and that's why he did it. And in that case, we have to not be of the people who are making people do things that he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he was an Arab. It was his Ada. He ate this. He did this. He did that. So you can't be rough and tough and tell people do this beyond that. Can't be like that. But we also can't be the people who are mutasahilun. People who are too easy. Everything is just no problem. Because some of the people of knowledge, they would reject some of the people today, people who put their intellect before the text, they reject 
sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ when they don't understand it, when it's an illa, the reason why he did this, they don't know, so as a result of that, they won't do it. And they'll downplay that thing. And that thing may be something you should be doing. So the fact that you comprehend or you don't comprehend something that he was doing doesn't constitute, doesn't give a person the right to downplay it. Not to try to do any and everything that he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is permissible for him, for the person to do. So the scholars of al-Hadith, when they gave the definition of the sunnah, they gave the best definition. It's what the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he did and what was done in his presence. What he said, what he did, and what was done in his presence. And he allowed it to be done. And it was the way he was created, the way his creation is, and the way his mannerisms were. That's the best, fullest definition. The scholars of Al-Usul, they said that the sunnah is the thing if you do it, you'll get rewarded. And if you leave it alone, you won't be punished for it. Now that's good sometimes, but it's not good all the time. The sunnah, in contrast to what is wajib. Wajib is that thing that if you do it, you get rewarded. And if you leave it, if you leave it, then you get punished. The opposite of that is haram. If you do it, you're punished. If you leave it, you get rewarded. And then you have the sunnah. If you leave it, if you do it, you get rewarded. If you don't do it, there's no problem. That's the opposite of a mubah. If you, if you do it or if you leave it, it's all the same. We say, no, we have to be careful with that. Because when we look at the companions, there were a lot of things that the Prophet did, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They didn't know the reason why he did it, and they followed him in doing those things. So therefore, because we're people who saying, we have to follow the companions. We're going to follow him in those things, but when we see that the thing was from his culture, we're not going to make it wajib upon people. We're not going to make it wajib upon ourselves. We're not going to make it unnecessarily difficult upon ourselves, but we won't minimize it as well. Because the companions did it. And they knew that that thing wasn't something that was from ibadah. It was something that he just did. And there are many things like that. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, when he met Al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib later on, he said, pull up your shirt, pull up your thobe, because I want to kiss the place where the Prophet kissed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he lifted up his shirt, and he put his hand on his navel, covered it up, and kissed him on the side. Where's the ibadah in that? He just wanted to kiss where the Prophet kissed. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, al-hasn is from ahl al-bayt and all of that. And he has virtues. But where is the ibadah in that? Umar radiallahu anhu said about the black stone. Wallahi, I know that you're just a rock. You can't hurt me. You can't harm me. And if I didn't see the Prophet kissing you, I would not have kissed you. And he kissed a black stone. The black stone has some religious significance to it because of what the sunnah said. But Umar said, I know you're just a rock. You can't help. You can't harm. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu used to go to Mecca. If he arrived at Mecca and he arrived at nighttime, he wouldn't go into Mecca. He would set up his camp on the outskirts of Mecca. They said, why? Why would you do that? Just go in Mecca. He said, this is what the prophet did and that's what I'm doing. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But why did the prophet do that? Did he mean to do that? Did he mean to do that? Some people say, well, if you don't know the reason why he did it, then it's not important. Abdullah ibn Umar, if the prophet did it, that's what he did. So we find him doing that. If someone wants to travel, and all of us are going to travel to Mecca, and we happen to arrive at nighttime, someone from the group says, look, he wouldn't go into Mecca. He didn't go into Mecca at the nighttime. And everyone was in agreement, okay, we can do that, no problem. But if one person wants to do it and it's heavy on everyone else, go ahead into Mecca and enter into Mecca. The point is, Abdullah ibn Umar. And there are a lot of situations like that. You don't have to know the illa. Even if it's not from ibadah, the Prophet did it. So try to get with the program. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, if the religion was based upon the intellect, my intellect, I would have thought that wiping on the bottom of the hoofs should take precedence over wiping on the top of it. Because the bottom is where the dirt is going to be collected. But the Prophet told us to wipe on the top. 
That's an issue if you use your mind, the illa, the reason. Where's the reason? Wiping on the hoof. Wipe on the bottom. That's where the dirt is. But the religion is not based upon your intellect. Sometimes you know the reason why. The thing is haram, khamr, and zina, and stealing. We know why that's haram. al kedib ghiba, namima. We know why all of that is haram. But many times we don't know why. The prophet did it, so just do it. If you have the ability to do it, even if you know that it is from the ada, something that he did just because he was an Arab. Anas ibn Malik, radiyallahu anhu, as his student said from the Tabi'in Abu Ta'uls, he said, I came into the room, Anas ibn Malik was eating some qara. That's a type of vegetable. It looks like a pumpkin, an Arabian pumpkin. He said, Wallahi, to the qara, this tree, he said, Wallahi, I don't like you. I don't like you. It's just that I saw the Prophet eating you, and because he ate you, I love it. Nobody's going to say eating that pumpkin has any stance or position in the deen. But Anas ibn Malik did it because the Prophet used to like it. So he made himself like it to be from the people who are of the sunnah. So we have to be in the middle. We have to be balanced. Don't be of the people who are too rough. Umar, doing his khilafa, he told his son Abdullah bin Umar, stop going overboard and trying to do everything the Prophet did. Walk in his footsteps, make your camel come to the place in the tree where he made his camel came to that tree. He got off of that camel and he went and called and asked the call of nature. He went to the toilet, Akramakumullah, you're going to do all that? He said, stop doing that. Because people are looking at you, Abdullah ibn Umar. You want to do it by yourself, between you and just you and Allah? No problem. But the people are looking at you. Don't make the religion difficult. Because there are prohibitions. Inna fikum munafireen. From you or those people will run the people away. If you were to hold the people to that standard, that high standard, the people are going to leave this religion. Wallahi, if we had to insist, you better have a miswak for every prayer. It's going to be difficult. I'm sure everybody here had a miswak at some time. Where are your miswak at right now? We lose that miswak. So I want to teach my children the importance of the sunnah. I tell them, if I catch you guys without that miswek, waylakum, waylakum. So at some point, my kids are going to say, our father's mshaddit. Our father's too rough and tough. We can't keep up with that miswek. Get us a miswek, Abby. We'll try to do the best. When it gets lost, no problem. Replace it. But to make it like that on people, there's a hadith. Don't run the people away. Make things easy for the people. And then the other side. Don't be easy with the sunnah to that degree. You see an individual and his thobe is open and he leaves his buttons open. Don't get upset with that and say some of the scholars said that's not even from the sunnah. He'll get rewarded for what he's doing. He'll get rewarded for what he's doing. So we have to be careful in this regard. From everything we took so far and what's coming and from it is this issue because more people, a lot of people, don't want to wear rings because of the sunnah. So what's the sunnah and what was the ring of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It was a band and in his band he had a, a, a stone, some other kind of stone. Whatever your stone, whatever you want it to be, that is permissible. Now we get into this issue of what Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi has brought. Some of the ulama of Islam, they said that wearing a ring is only for people who have responsibilities and only to be worn if you're going to stamp something because you're going to see that's the hadith that caused the prophet to take a ring sallallahu alaihi wasallam he never had a ring prior to that until this incident happened and then he took a ring to stamp his letters so if you're a judge if you're an imam if you have some type of responsibility or job where you're going to stamp something official documents then it's the sunnah for you to wear the ring. It's not the sunnah other than that. But if you wear a ring and you're not one of those people, then it's mubah. It's mubah. It's like you sitting right here. It's like you wearing that color thobe. It's like you not wearing a hat. It's like you wearing your jacket. It's like you doing just the things that, no problem if you do it, no problem if you don't do it, but don't call it the sunnah. So that's ikhtilaf between the scouts. Scholars also, Ikhwani, talked a lot about concerning the ring. 
the types of rings that are permissible and not permissible because there are some metals that are not permissible. Everybody knows about the issue of gold. The Prophet prohibited us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from wearing rings made out of iron. Al-Hadid. He saw a man. He had a ring out of gold. When he saw it, he turned away. The man knew it was because of the ring. He went, he changed the ring, got an iron ring. He came. The Prophet saw the iron ring. He turned away. The man said, why ya Rasulullah? He said, this is the beautification of the people of the hellfire. So the man took that iron ring off and threw it down. He went and got a ring out of silver. The prophet saw him with the ring of silver and he left him. So when the people say that wearing the ring is something special, just if you're the imam or the judge, Rasulullah saw his companions wearing rings. And they made it a point to follow him in this issue. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. But we're not getting deep into all of that. There's a lot to be said about the fiqh of the ring. From the scholars of al-Islam. It's those scholars who wrote about everything. As I always tell you brothers, there are books about the fiqh of the ring. Everything you need to know. Ali ibn Abi Talib said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said or prohibited us from wearing the ring on these two fingers. So the man is going to wear the ring on this finger, he's going to wear the ring on that finger, the woman can wear the ring on any finger. So the man is trying to wear the ring of the sunnah, but it's on his thumb, it's on the wrong finger. So there's a lot, a lot to be said, a lot. Al-Imam al-Bayhaqi, the great scholar and muhaddith of the Shafi Madhab, he has a book he called the Kitab al-Jami' fil Khatim. Everything you need to know about these narrations and what the ulama said. Al-Imam Malik, what hand should the ring be on? That's the next chapter. Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi was of the opinion the ring should be on the right hand, Ahlul Hadith. Al-Imam Malik said no. And other ulama, the ring should be on the left hand. And he disliked it being on the right hand. And they bring their adilla and so forth and so on. A lot of information. The student of Al-Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Rajab Al-Hanbali, he has a tremendously beneficial book that he went in details about everything of what these scholars said and these different conflicting reports and how we understand all of it. Rahmatullahi Ali in his book, Ahkam Al Khawatim Wa Ma Yata'alluqu Biha. The rules and regulations of rings and everything you need to know that's connected with it. So, this is not a chapter for the Muslim to come and say, these issues are irrelevant. When are you going to get finished with this book? We want to really talk about things that, hey, that's knowledge. This is knowledge. Be patient with the knowledge and get to know your Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and their fiqh about these issues that, again, remember, as he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةٍ Tell the people about me even if it's only one thing. Go and tell someone something about me even if it's one thing. And don't minimize the ma'roof. Anything that's ma'roof, beneficial, ilm, don't minimize it. That thing may get you into the jannah. Prostitute lady got into the jannah from feeding the dog, giving him water. So don't minimize anything from al-ma'roof. First hadith, ikhwani, which is hadith number 87 in the book. And this is chapter number 13 and number 12. Al-Imam at tirmidhi brought the hadith of Anas ibn Malik who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a ring that was silver and the stone that was inside of it was from Ethiopia. It was an Ethiopian stone. Either the way the ring, the style of the ring was Ethiopian or the thing in the middle of it was from Ethiopia. How do they know that? Because they used to know. Musa ibn Umair used to have money when he embraced Islam, he was one of the richest of the rich. And he was a young man. He used to wear the best perfumes from Persia. He used to wear the best shoes from Rome. He used to wear the best silk and linen and the finest clothes from all over the world. They used to know. So this particular ring that he had, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it had an Ethiopian flex to it, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Ali Wasallam. So that's the first thing. He had a ring, and in it was an Ethiopian rock, a gem that was from Ethiopia. 
That's easy, but we're going to come back to this because there's going to be something that's taking place. Hadith number 88 is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar. May Allah be pleased with them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, he took a ring that was made out of silver. And he used to stamp his leathers with that ring. And he didn't wear the ring. He had a ring that was silver. And he used to stamp letters with that ring. And Ibn Umar said, and he didn't wear the ring. Some of the ulama of al-Islam, for the one who is a student, he'll come and he'll read things like this. One hadith is saying that. One companion says this. The other one said the opposite. The one with weak iman and weak or light intelligence, when this happens to him, he's ready to go and to do something sacrilegious. He wants to burn the book. He wants to throw the book in the bin. He wants to discard the whole sunnah. Before taking the time out, hey, just go and read. Is the thing authentic? And if it is, what did the scholar say about it? So some of the ulama of al-Islam, they ruled that this hadith or this effort is weak. And they said that it was shad, it's irregular, because it goes against what's established. He had a ring and he wore it. It goes against that. And in the chain of narration, there's a problem. But for the sake of argument, if it is authentic, they said, okay, no problem. The Prophet ﷺ had multiple rings. He had multiple rings. One ring he had that he didn't wear. That it was just for stamping. He used to stamp. Because one of the hadith said that. He used to stamp his letters with that particular ring. So he had another ring other than that one. Maybe Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he didn't see him when he had a ring. So it's no big deal. So whatever the case is, I think the most important point about these types of ahadith is not really to take up a lot of time in making the harmonization, but to say there's always a way to harmonize. Always, always. Either it's weak. Let's keep it moving now. Okay, maybe Abdullah ibn Umar, he didn't see him with the ring. And when he reported this, he reported at a time when it was at the beginning and so forth and so on. But I think the real important thing is don't be one of those people where an issue comes to you in this religion. It's in the Quran and it's in the Sunnah. The ayat of the Quran said, Verily, those people who believe in the last day, in Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Yahud and the Nasara and the Sabi'een, and these people are going to be in the Jannah. The person said, but, but the Imam just read just now, just now, that those people who say that they are Christians, the Messiah is the Son of Allah, they're in the hellfire. So there's a contradiction. I'm going to burn the Quran. Hashirillah. No, you just got to come and learn what was said. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. It's an easy issue. Easy. And it's there to be understood because it's been explained. No one's going to bring any examples that have not been written and explained by the scholars of yesterday. Rahmatullahi alayhim. Hadith number 89 is the hadith of Anas ibn Malik. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had a ring and his ring was silver. And it was inlaid. The gem that was inlaid was also from silver as well. Okay, he had multiple rings. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Hadith number 90. Hadith number 90. Is the hadith of Anas ibn Umarik. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to write a letter to the Ajam. To the Ajam. To the non-Arabs. Anyone who was not an Arab is an Ajam. He wanted to start writing letters to them to give them da'wah ilallah. It was said to him, Ya Rasulullah, the non-Arabs, these non-Arabs, they do not read, they do not accept, they will not take from you any letter that does not have a stamp on it. So there was a ring that was made for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam and he used to use it as his stamp. He said, I can still look at that ring and see the whiteness, the glitter of that ring. So this tells us why he took the ring. So it doesn't appear to be something that's religious. It doesn't seem to be something that has anything to do with ibadah. It showed how he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, looked at the life of the non-Muslims. He wants to give them doubt a lot. There are things that non-Muslims do, things that are part of their life, their lifestyle. Al-Islam is not against that. Al-Islam allows us to borrow from what they're doing 
as long as there's no prohibition so that we can relate to them and they can relate to us. And that's an important lesson in this hadith. During the time of the Prophet ﷺ, not once did he have a naval campaign. He didn't wage war on the sea, in the ocean. It wasn't needed. So are the Muslims going to say now, when Islam started spreading and there's a need for a naval campaign, we have to have a navy. Someone's going to say, that's an innovation. The Prophet didn't do it. No, of course. Because although he didn't do it, it's still from the Sunnah. And even told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the army, the first army that wages war on the sea and the ocean is going to go to the Jannah. So many things that the non-Muslims used to do at the beginning of Islam, he used to prohibit the women. Once you have a baby and your baby is breastfeeding, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to tell the Muslim women to take the child off of the breast if she got pregnant again. And anyone who had a child and this happened to him, the child that is breastfeeding from a mother who is pregnant many times suffers from diarrhea, akramakumullah. The milk changes. And that happened to the babies of the companions. So he wanted those children to be strong. So he said, don't do that. Stop breastfeeding them if you're pregnant. And then the news and the information came to him that the Persians and the Romans, they do that. And it didn't bother them. So he had no problem with coming out to the people. And he said, I stopped you from doing this. I had told you to do this. But this doesn't affect, and it doesn't affect in a bad way, the Persians and the Romans. And they're warriors and soldiers. He said, so you can do it. So borrowing from other people, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as there's no prohibition. No prohibition. But when we find a prohibition, then we have to avoid it. No matter how much it makes sense to you, you have to avoid it. Well, this way of giving dawah with the kuffar, this is very effective to have music, to have this and to have that. It's very effective because they do it. We don't do it just because it's effective, just because it's going to affect some people. If there are prohibitions, we have to stay away from it. So he took the ring, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, in order to stamp the letters. That happened, as I told you, in the last of the sixth year after the hijrah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wrote letters to all of the leading emperors and kings of that day. And at the top of the list, there was the Qaisr and the Kisra and the Najashi. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent his companion Abdullah ibn Hudhafa. He sent him to the leader of Persia, the Kisra. And that man ripped up the letter of the Nabi calling him to a tawheed and to al-Islam. So the Prophet made dua against him that Allah rips up his kingdom and Allah ripped up his kingdom. They started fighting amongst themselves and his daughter took over. And he said after that, any group of people who put a woman in charge of their affairs, they won't be successful. He ripped up the letter, so Allah ripped up his kingdom. Again, that principle, the reward will be comparable to the action. As you do, it will be done unto you. You do good, good will come back to you. Remember me, I'll remember you. Remember me in the good times, I'll remember you in the bad times. Take care of my contract, I'll take care of your contract. So as you do, it will be done unto you. He sent his companion, Dih ibn Khalifa al-Kalbi, he sent him to the Caesar of Rome. And that Caesar of Rome he accepted the nabuwa of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but he didn't accept his risala. He acknowledged and saw, yes, he's a nabi. He believed in that, but he didn't accept the whole total risala, and he didn't allow his people to believe because when they heard him say, "Yes, this is the truth, what you brought," I believe in what you're saying. I believe that you are a nabi. What you're saying. The people ran away from him, and he said, nah, nah, don't do that. I, 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 I'm not going to be with him. I'm going to stay with you. He sent that letter to him, and that man read that letter, and he asked him some questions. He dealt with the Christians and the Jews. He said, I believe in you. You are a Nabi. And that's a Dalil, Ikhwani. It is not enough for the person to say, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a good man. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one of the 100 influential human beings in history. He's number one. That doesn't make you a Muslim. There are other things that you have to do. And then lastly, he sent his companion, Amr ibn Umayyah. 
radiallahu anhum to the Najashi, to the Najashi. But the Najashi is just the title of the leader of Ethiopia. That's not his name. Many of the people call the Najashi of Ethiopia who let the companions come, they call him the Najashi, like that's his name. Just like the Kisra and the Qaisar, those are the names of the emperors. That Najashi, they have different names. And this is not the Najashi that he sent Amr ibn Umayyah to. Because that Najashi is dead and he already had accepted Islam and he died. Uh, he died years prior to that. This is the reason why the Prophet took that ring, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The next hadith, number 91, is the hadith, again, of Anas ibn Malik. The Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had a ring, and on his ring he had Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. So from his ring is that he had Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. A long time ago in Al Medina, I remember researching something about this ring, this part of wearing the ring. And I read the statements that the scholars of the Sunnah said that his ring said Muhammad at the bottom, Rasul in the middle, Allah at the top. And in this masjid and in other masajid, given Dawud Allah in talking about the importance of a tawheed. And the adab that comes when a person has a tawheed. Like, you can't say crazy things like, may the force be with you, because that's what they say on Star Wars. Don't talk like that. What do you mean the force may you may the force be with you? Some of these commercials. The commercial, there is a coffee called Maxwell House. Maxwell House Coffee. They said it's good to the last drop. So you see the Muslims say, Allah is like Maxwell House coffee, good to the last drop. Don't say stuff like that. These catchy phrases, Allah is like, don't say that. You have to have adab. Because we saw that from the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as it relates to this issue and talking about the importance of a tawheed, I would always mention that in his ring, at the bottom, Muhammad, in the middle, Rasul, at the top, Allah, showing Allah is up above everything else. And Muhammad is not over Allah. So if you have in your house those pictures, Allah, Muhammad. Don't put him equal and don't put Muhammad above. That's from the etiquette. And I still stand by that. I stand by that. But I want to rectify something here. Today I had an opportunity to look for that. I said, okay, I have to find that. Because I remember I saw it a long time ago. When I went back, I realized it was a statement of the ulama that the ring said, Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. But no hadith clearly said that. No companion described it as that. And when you read this hadith, the zahir of what comes at you is Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. So there was an issue of ikhtilaf between the scholars. How was his ring? Was it Muhammad Rasul Allah or Muhammad Rasul Allah? It appears that the clear proof is Muhammad at the top, Rasul in the middle, and Allah at the bottom. And it doesn't go against a tawheed because if this is what some of the people understanding from the hadith without any takalluf, then it is what it is. And plus, when you have the Quran as well. There are ayat that are in the Quran, the ayat that is on top of it has the name of some Nabi and the ayat under it has the name of Allah. So we're not going to say that that's not adab. And in the Quran itself, the way the Arabic goes, in many ayat of the Quran, Allah Azzawajal mentioned his slave first and then mentioned Allah after the slave because that's just the way the Arabic language goes sometimes. وَإِذَا ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنَّ And remember when Ibrahim was tested by his Lord Allah and he completed those issues. So I want to stand here to say I've taken that opinion back. I'm of the opinion that the ring said Muhammad, Rasul, Allah because I didn't find any clear evidence to suggest anything other than that. So Allah knows best. So from the ring of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had a ring. It was made out of silver. He had a ring 
And in his ring, there was Ethiopian a jinn, a jim, G-E-M. He had a ring, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one that he used to clearly stamp with. It had Muhammad Rasul Allah. Some of the scholars said other than that. In the book that I told you about by Imam Ibn Rajab and Hanbali, that book, the Ahkam of the Khawatim, he said, Al Imam al Tirmidhi mentioned this hadith in his book, Al Shama'il al Muhammadiyah. But it appears that this hadith is, this hadith, those people from the scholars, the majority of them, said that it's Muhammad Rasul Allah. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to go with because we didn't see and we didn't read anything other than that. If you brothers find anything about that or other than it, be my guest. We're always looking to be corrected so that we'll know we're standing on the right thing and in the right place. Next hadith, Ikhwani, we have three more hadith in this chapter. Hadith number 92. And that is the hadith that tells us Anas ibn Umanik said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wrote to the Kisra and to the Qais and to the Najashi and it was said to them, to him, these people, they don't accept any book, any letter that comes to them except that it has to be stamped. So therefore, a stamp was made for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and it had the naqsh in it. It had them, it was manqush with Muhammad Rasul Allah, similar to the previous one. Next hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he went into the bathroom, he used to take off his ring. If he went into the toilet, akramakum Allah, he used to take off his ring. This hadith is very, 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 very weak. It's a munkar hadith in the chain of narration. People who are known as being liars, people who made some serious mistakes, and take it as a principle, all of the ahadith about the ring. He took the ring off before going into the bathroom and put it down. He took the ring off and put it in his mouth and he went into the bathroom. He took the ring off, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and put it in his pocket. All of those ahadith are extremely weak or fabricated. But nonetheless, 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 it does show, and many people use this from the ulama of Islam, that when it comes to the etiquettes of the toilet and the hamam, akramakumullah, there are things we should do, things we shouldn't do. He was using the toilet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and a man came in and started giving him salams, and he didn't respond to that man. And he made a prohibition, and he said, if two men are using the toilet, don't be using the toilet, talking to each other. The Muslim goes in, he gets in, and he gets out. He doesn't do what the non-Muslims do, where they go in and they have magazines, and they have newspapers, and now with the mobile phone, he takes in there the mobile phone and he's doing Facebook in the toilet with the mobile phone. He never puts the mobile phone down. As soon as the taslim, salam alaykum, salam alaykum, he looks at the mobile phone before making the dhikr. Mobile phone is a fitna now. So the Muslim, as it relates to the toilet, he's in with a particular foot, he comes out, and that's it. He doesn't do anything. His life has nothing in there. Nothing in there. So based on that, you'll find in the books of Al-Fiqh that they're always mentioning as a delil. You shouldn't bring anything into the toilet that has Allah's name on it. These hadith that are fabricated, they're very weak. You can't accept them. But although they're weak, we're not going to say they're weak so you can bring a book into the toilet and read it because those hadith are weak. No. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam prohibited the men, don't talk while you are in the toilet. It's a place you should be quiet to the best of your ability. And you only talk based upon necessity. Due to necessity. The last hadith, Ikhwani, the last hadith in this particular chapter, inshallah, is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he took a ring and it was made out of silver. And it used to be in his hand. And then after he died, Abu Bakr took that ring and he wore it. And then after he died, Umar took that ring and Umar wore it. And then it was in the hand of Uthman doing his khilafah. And Uthman, he was sitting at the well of Aris. And when he was sitting at the well of Aris, the ring, he twisted it like this and it came off and it fell in the well. 
and they lost the ring. For three days, Earthman told the people, come and help me find this ring. For three days, they were looking for the ring, Muhammad Rasul Allah. And that goes to show what we mentioned last week as well. It goes to show that if there is something that has been left by the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hold on to it. Make a tabarruk bi with it. Raise it up if it belongs to him. But again, there's no delil that his ring is still in this dunya. Where, we, where is it at? Who has it? No delil. Many of those things that he owned, they were destroyed because of fitna, because of wars. They were destroyed because of time. When he died, when he died, his companion al burab ibn Azib came and he said, when the Prophet died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't leave a dirham, he didn't leave a dinar, he didn't leave a male slave, he didn't leave a female slave, he only left a few things. So here these people are coming telling us his asa is here, his staff is here, his sword is here, sandals are here, his ring is here. It may be here, but where is it at? Allah knows best. And we're not going to waste time looking for it. So this is what happened with those companions. The Khulafa al-Rashidun, the three of them, they wore the ring and during the time of Uthman, he twisted the ring and it fell off. He had the ring and it fell off. Another very important narration is the narration of what happened with a companion by the name of Mu'ayqib. Mu'ayqib. His name is Mu'ayqib, Mu'ayqib ibn Abi Fatima Dosi. The hadith say he dropped the ring in the water. Mu'ayqib dropped the ring in the water. And it's authentic. And this hadith is saying Uthman dropped the ring in the water. The one who has some problem with his iman, he comes and he again, he says, you see those hadith, you see? Islam is not really, and all he had to do is, look what the scholar said. It's a plausible explanation. And also, in addition to that, in addition to that, you not knowing the details of this hadith and how to harmonize this hadith, you not knowing how to do it, how does it affect your everyday life? Who dropped the ring in the well? How does it affect? What are the consequences of that? You're not knowing. Person may say, well, if it can happen to this hadith, maybe it happened to other hadith. He's saying no. Because that will bring you right back to this one. And that is, there's always a pl plausible explanation, possibility. And Allah knows best. People with iman, they understand that. It's easy. This says that, this says this. Maybe that's weak, maybe that's authentic, maybe that's abrogated and it was abrogated by this. In this case, they're both authentic and there's no abrogation. And Allah knows what happened. Maybe the narrator made a mistake, I don't know. But some of the scholars, they said, it's possible that Uthman gave the ring to Mu'iqib for whatever reason. And when he gave the ring back to Uthman, that's when it fell off. What's the consequence of it? The important thing is, they looked for that ring of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam for three days. After they couldn't find the ring, they let the situation go. So this is the introduction of the ring of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The next chapter is going to deal with bi idnillah, which hand he had it on, because there is ikhtilaf between the scholars. And I tell you right now for free, both hands is okay, and both fingers are okay for the man. But concerning the ring of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Rasulullah, and also the stone that he had in the middle, he used to wear that turned towards his palm. He didn't have his ring out like this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His ring, Muhammad Rasulullah, was turned like this, which is another proof and indication. The ring was not for zina. It wasn't for beautification. His ring was for a hajjah. There was a need for it. And that knee was to stamp it. And that's strong in the position for the ulama who say, the man doesn't wear the ring for zina. He wears the ring if he needs the ring. But I told you, the prophet saw the man with the gold ring, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, saw him with the iron ring, then he saw him with the silver ring, and he allowed him to have it. Where was that man stamping things? So he saw it, and he didn't say anything. He allowed it, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And after him, his companions wore rings. 
other than the three Khalifas, other than the three Khalifas. So I think that covers, for the most part, most of what is concerning the physical ring of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, made out of silver. He had multiple rings. One had Muhammad Rasulullah. One other rings had Ethiopian uh, gems in it. He turned it towards himself. And he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, encouraged and allowed people to wear it on his right hand and the left hand. And we're going to come to that, inshallah, next week. So we're going to stop here, and I want to say next Wednesday, I'm sorry, we're not going to have the class next Wednesday. I'm going to be traveling Sunday to Kuwait, and then the following Saturday. Can somebody tell me when is the 11th, inshallah? When is the 11th of March? What day is that on? The 11th of March. Okay, so we'll have the following class hopefully from Wednesday, because I think, I, I think I'm leaving Thursday morning, inshallah. So... Next Wednesday's class, there's no dars. And if I'm gone, I won't think I'm, I won't be here for the khutbah. If they have my name on the thing, I won't be here for the khutbah. Do you brothers have any questions concerning today's dars about the khatam of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam? Tafadhi ya ahi. Wedding rings, if they are bought practicing the practice of the kuffar who use wedding rings because of superstition and shirk and kuffar, then the wedding ring is la yambaghi wa la yajuz. And the wedding ring is a kabira from the kabair. Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fa huwa minhum. A tastabdiluna alladhi huwa adna billadhi huwa khayr. Don't be like those people because that's something we shouldn't follow them in. It was the understanding that the wedding ring would be something that the man would purchase to give to his wife and she would give it back to him, give him one. And being around the finger, particularly this finger, they call it the wedding finger. This is the wedding finger. So if you want to know if a man is married or a woman is married with the non-Muslims, and just look at the arm, look at the hand, this indication they're married. Because they believed that there's a vein in this finger that goes up to the heart and if you put this ring around that finger, you'll capture the love of that individual. We don't have that in our deen. We don't have that in our deen, khurafat. These people are talking about civilization and civilized. And we're always on the back foot apologizing, being defensive. That khurafat. But there was an incident where the man came, the lady came, and she offered herself for marriage to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He looked at her up and down. And he turned away and he said, I don't want to get married. La hajatili fi zawaj. I don't want to get married. A man seeing the opportunity said, marry her to me, Ya Rasulullah. He said, what can you give her for the dowry? He said, I don't have anything. I'm broke. He said, get up and go find something. Even if it is an iron ring, an iron ring. The man went to look for the iron ring. He came back. He said, I couldn't even find that. Can't even find an iron ring. He said, what do you know from the Quran? He said, I know surah this and that and this and this and that. He said, I marry you to her. Based upon that is the dowry. You teach her the Quran. And that hadith has a lot of fiqh to it. A lot of fiqh to it. How the lady presented herself to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Something that's only for him. Lady shouldn't present herself to any man. Only to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's permissible for her to talk indirectly if she is in her last talaq and she's in her idda. She can talk indirectly, but she can't present herself. The prophet looked at the lady. He told the companions, look at that which will cause you to get married. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't get married on the blind. The hirs of the companions. Ya Rasulullah, I want to get married. Hook me up. And the prophet married her as the wali. He's not her father, he's not her uncle, he's not her brother, or she wouldn't came to get married to him. So without any kalam to the father, the uncle, the brother, he can marry her. And Nabi you awla bil mu'minina min anfusi. He can do that. And you have to listen to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The lady didn't have a problem. And it shows how poor those companions were. He couldn't go and get a, a, an iron ring. An iron ring. And it shows how you can get married 
giving someone the Quran. I wouldn't advise that myself. I wouldn't advise you guys, someone comes to your daughter and says, hey, I want to marry your daughter. He says, okay, what are you going to give her? He says, I'm giving her a new mushaf, brand spanking new. Has the rules of tajweed in it. He's going to say to you, no, no, you have to bring some more. You have to bring some more to the table. But when we go and get married, that's what we say. I'm going to give you Sayyid Bukhari, volume one. And the other seven or eight are mine. And then when the divorce takes place, they take it with them. So you can marry someone and teach someone the Quran and get money from it because it has some monetary values, the dowry. But this thing about the ring aspect of it, Achi, the Ikhwani, the ring is two things, what he mentioned. And the other thing is, the Prophet said, go find a ring even if it's an iron ring. It's not permissible to wear an iron ring. He prohibited us from wearing an iron ring. And he said, this is the beauty of the people in the hellfire. Not just gold, iron as well. So why would he send this man to get an iron ring? Because it's permissible for the women. Just like gold is permissible for the woman. The woman can wear a golden ring. She can wear a gold necklace. She can wear a gold watch and so forth and so on. She can wear an iron necklace, iron ring, iron watch. She can wear that. But the man can't. But some of the scholars took this hadith to show it's permissible for men to wear iron rings, but it seems that that's not permissible. So the point is, give her that as a dowry, it's a ring. But it wasn't the first thing and it wasn't like their culture, like their ada, what it is. Okay? So don't do that. If a man wants to give his wife a ring as a gift later on, let it be after the wedding. He wants to give her a ring, don't give an engagement ring, don't give her that other ring. After the nikah, give her a nice ring, no problem. It's beautiful, she'll like that. Now, for the Now, the inscription is not solely and strictly for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People get in, uh, uh, rings and they get uh, things inscribed, inscribed on it. You know, I know one brother, he's an Arab guy from Palestine. And he said, uh, he wrote on his thing, Ya Umar, al mot qareeb. Umar, death is soon. He had a, a silver ring like that. Uh, so if a person wants to get a ring with his own style or something like that, there's no problem, inshallah. This is not something that is khas. If we're going to say something is only for the Nabi, we have to bring that delil. We have to bring that proof. He only can marry more than four. He only can fast consecutively. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Only he can take over the wilaya of a man and marry his daughter off, his sister off. Only him. Girl can't come to the masjid. Lady can't come to the masjid. Sister can't come to the masjid and say, divorce me from my husband and give me a khula just like that. No matter what he's doing and everything she's saying about him is true. He's a bad guy. But still, we can't cross over the line. He's the wali. We have to say, hey, you're responsible for this lady. She said this, she said that. His daughter, he doesn't want his daughter to marry someone because the father's a racist and the father's a problem. When his daughter comes to get married, we can't marry his daughter off like that. Only the prophet can do that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Only. And the delil show that. Only he can do certain things. But we say he can do certain things when there's proof. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Fadiyah. Yeah, this is permissible, but it's going to be something that's going to take some steps. That's what I'm saying. She just can't come in with a guy and you marry her off. She just can't come in with a complaint and you give her an issue her a khula. He says, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la nikah illa bi wali wa sultan wali man la wali laha. Another hadith said, wa in, ish, wa in, wa in ish jajara fal wali sultan wali man la wali laha. There's no nikah except with the wali. And the authority is the wali for the lady who doesn't have a wali. And if they're fighting the lady and her wali, the husband, the wife, the lady and her father, they're fighting, then the sultan becomes the wali. Because the father doesn't have the right to 
prevent her from marrying. He doesn't have the right to force her to marry who she doesn't want to marry. But we always tell the sister, hey, you better take it easy in this decision. Blood is thicker than water. And if this guy starts to go sideways later on, you destroy the bridge between you and your dad. So you probably want to swallow that one and deal with it. So the point here is you're just not going to take, to marry her off. You're going to call her father up and say, look, why doesn't you want to marry your daughter to Abu Isa? He says, because Abu Isa is um, not for my culture. And Abu Isa has a wife. And Abu Isa is um, this. He's about to travel to a, a far land somewhere over in Timbuktu. And Abu Isa this, Abu Isa that. We're going to listen to that. And we're going to say, sister, relax. Relax. He says, because Abu Isa, for an example, Abu Isa is an example, fictitious individual. This Abu Isa, um, he, he, uh, um, he's not from my tribe. He's not from my tribe. He's a Begum and I'm a Mogul. I'm, 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 I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a Chowdhury. That's what he says. And that's what he's thinking about. And that brother's a good brother. So we're going to try to convince him. But if he insists on being like that and the girl wants to move forward, we're going to marry her. The, the leader will marry her. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Okay, then. We stop here. We ask Allah Ta'ala for a tawfiq. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa I'm not here next week, inshallah, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then that next Friday, I don't think I'm going to be here. But I mean, I'm going to let you guys know.